Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to our fifth uh, plenary session. My name is uh, Laura Ferkovic and I'm uh, working from Center of Technology Transfer. Uh, I'm working as a junior researcher on the ZEV Innovation Project and today I will um, make a short introduction uh, of our project and program, our project partners, our company, uh, the potential and aim of the project and today's topic of the plenary session and our lecturers. Uh, the Innovation Project is uh, funded by Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway through the EEA and Norway Grants Fund for Regional Cooperation. Uh, our project benefits from 1.6 million euro grant and uh, the fund recognizes sec uh, priority sectors, sectors which are innovation, research, ed education and competitiveness. Um, we have uh, the, the project started in uh, June 2020 and it ends in January 2024. Uh, we have five project partners across the EEA and they are uh, Center of Technology Transfer as a lead partner from Croatia, from Zagreb, uh, Baltic Sea and Space Cluster from Poland, uh, Innovacije Razvoj also uh, from Croatia and our valuable OKP uh, and Vinko Innovation, our expertise partner come from Norway. Uh, I would like to talk now uh, a little about our company. Uh, CTT is uh, a company founded in 1996 by uh, University of Zagreb, Faculty of Mechanical Engineering and Naval Architecture. Uh, strategic purpose of the company is to connect science and the economy and enhance the competitiveness of creation industry and, and the role of our faculty during this process. Our uh, activities are uh, transfer transferring knowledge into economy and we are actively working on EU projects uh, uh, and lifelong learning. Uh, also incubation and acceleration of innovative ideas startup, spin-offs, and student incubator. Uh, what is the aim and potential of our project? Uh, on the left, we see a, a five keystone uh, image that we created, that is innovation hub, tailored expertise, commercialization, best practices, and transnational collaboration. Um, it is important to stress out that, uh, that uh, Uh, that uh, our project is uh, actively promoting zero emission vessels and innovations in the field in the in the maritime world and that is why we called it uh, we shortened the name of the project and it is zev innovation uh, establishment of an efficient and sustainable network involvement of multidisciplinary partners putting focus on collaborative development supporting market uptake of ZEVs and acting as a key player on the ZEV market in the European economic area. Uh, finally, we came uh, to the slide with uh, information about today's topic. Uh, uh, the, today's plenary session is entitled Human Factors in the New Maritime World. Uh, and uh, as new technologies uh, arise and uh, being introduced, uh, with uh, which are uh, reducing carbon emissions from shipping and uh, which are um, which which are um, that are batteries or hydrogen uh, we have to ensure how our people are, are are our people ready to make the best out of these possibilities and a uh, few questions arise what are the impacts of innovative technologies on training and competence requirements how will innovations in the maritime world affect behavior in emergency situations and is it possible to remove human factor from shipping in the in the near future? Uh, I would like to introduce our lect today's lecturers. Um, the first lecturer is Anders Valland from Sintef. Uh, he will present uh, human factors in the new maritime world. Uh, the second is Carlos Trunje, my colleague from CDT. Uh, he will present our work uh, uh, regarding ZEV Innovation Survey. Uh, he is, um, and he, you will be able to, to answer a few questions. The next presenter is Gunnar Lambic, also from Sintef from Norway, and he will present a nexus between innovation and management of human factors. 
Uh, and finally, we have Zbigniew Bicinski from Gdynia Maritime School, and he will present uh, vessels subject to the IGF code, training requirements, and human safety factor. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, here you have contacts of our managing director, Boris Josic, me and our company. Uh, feel free to contact us uh, to, if you're interested in collaboration, want to innovate, uh, looking for new opportunities. We are open uh, to communication to all. Also, you can write uh, questions in, uh, in our chat here in Zoom, and we will uh, then share your questions with today's uh, lecturers and, this, and start the discussion. Uh, thank you for your attention. I will now stop sharing my screen uh, and uh, Anders, you can uh, jump in and uh, tell a bit more about yourself, about your work. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Laurel. Um, I will share my screen. Doing two things at once is always difficult. So um, I'll share my screen first and then I'll talk. <laughs> Uh, hopefully, you'll now see my uh, presentation. Yep, Every, yeah, everything is fine. Yeah. Yes, we see it. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, my name is Anders Wallan. I'm a research manager at Sintef uh, in Trondheim and uh, working uh, with uh, one of the subsidiary companies called Sintef Ocean. And Sintef Ocean is uh, working on, well, basically everything that has to do with uh, uh, the ocean, everything from below the seabed, uh, everything on the seabed, everything in the water column uh, between the seabed and the surface, everything on the surface and everything above. So uh, uh, we're looking both at uh, technological solutions for oil and gas uh, production, uh, mining on the seabed, uh, and we're also looking at uh, shipping uh, transporting of goods uh, and, of course, uh, how to harvest food and resources from the ocean. So that's uh, Sintef Ocean. I, I have a colleague who will be presenting later today, uh, Gunnar Lambeck, who is also part of uh, Sintef, uh, but uh, another part of Sintef, and he will be presenting himself and his own background. I've been with uh, Sintef since uh, 2002, so it's uh, getting close to it's, it's 19 years now. I've uh, been uh, working in different positions, but since uh, about 2015, I have been working uh, uh, specifically with uh, maritime engines, energy systems, alternative fuels, uh, emissions, and uh, emission abatement from shipping. Um, with that in mind, um, some of the topics that I, I will be covering in this talk. Uh, I will be brushing quite briefly on, on the topic of the human factor, but I will uh, talk uh, uh, mostly about why it is important. And uh, Gunnar, uh, my colleague, will then come uh, much more into the human factor side. He's been doing research uh, on this and will be diving more deeply into it. Um, I will focus a little bit on utilization of technology and also the um, uh, uh, risks that are um, emerging when it comes to new technology. There's always risk emerging with new technology. But first of all, I would like to, to talk a little bit about the backdrop. So why, um, possibly it's, it's known to everyone, but um, uh, the current global fuel situation for shipping is this approximately three quarters of all fuel that is used by global shipping is still heavy fuel oil. And approximately one quarter is distillate. So that's marine gas oil and marine diesel oil. Um, the exact mix, uh, even though these figures are from 2017, they haven't really changed much. Uh, any alternative fuels are in this very small slice of about 2%. And that's the backdrop and the challenge since the IMO has, says, uh, has said that uh, we are going to reduce uh, emissions from shipping, 40% uh, of CO2 by 2030 and 50% of all greenhouse gases by 2050. That's still the ambition for the IMO uh, and currently it does not look to change much uh, in the future. But this is the backdrop. This is why everybody is talking about low emission, ultra low emission and eventually possibly zero emission from shipping as well. 
There are a lot of proposed solutions um, that follow from these ambitions. And uh, I've just put up some of them here. Um, I see I'm, I'm missing uh, uh, two company logos, but uh, no, three company logos, but I'll go through them. So if uh, we start up in the um, upper left corner, uh, we have a vessel using flatten rotors. And that's uh, my example of, of uh, vessels using technology to harness the wind. So harnessing the wind to drive vessels is nothing new. It's uh, really <laughs> some uh, a, a kind of a, a dropping back to what we used to do with sailing vessels, although we're using quite advanced technology today to do it. Flettner rotors being a very good example of that. You could also have uh, sail arrangements, rigid sails, ordinary sails, uh, even kites have been proposed. Um, you have the wave foil in the lower left corner, which is uh, using foils uh, on the vessel. You can see them at the front uh, and the bow of the vessel uh, under the water, and that's improving the hydrodynamic performance of the vessel. Um, for some vessels, this is very good, um, and uh, it will yield quite a few percent uh, of uh, energy efficiency for the hull. If you go to the upper right corner, it's the Becker Mavis duct, which is used to enhance the performance of the propeller and the propeller thrust. So it's increasing the energy efficiency of the propell uh, propeller in, in moving the ship forward. Then you have the Silvestream uh, technologies uh, as an example of uh, air lubrication of the hull. So you, uh, using compressed air, uh, which flows out of the hull at the or uh, different orifices um, um, distributed along the hull to reduce the friction of the hull. And then uh, we have an example of uh, uh, an internal combustion engine from ABC engines, uh, which uh, is claimed to use up to 85% hydrogen as fuel. Uh, quite interesting technology and interesting development. In the middle, you'll find in the middle uh, upper part uh, is uh, actually Siemens blue drive. Uh, and that's an example of uh, the complexity of new machinery installations. Uh, where you have uh, ordinary uh, generating sets using internal combustion engines. And these engines can run on, on a variety of, of different fuels from gas to liquids. You have batteries, you have a, a, a advanced distribution system for electrical power. And you have basically a system that's based on, uh, uh, that is a power station on board and distributing power electrically to all of the consumers. You have chargers, batteries, you might even have fuel cells in this uh, setup. And then the lower part is um, uh, one of the most ambitious projects currently, um, which is Havila, uh, which is a Norwegian ship owner. Havila is building one of the coastal route vessels for Norway. And uh, it is uh, already fitted with uh, a large battery pack, about six megawatt hours. Uh, it will have LNG, as its main fuel. And it also will be using fuel cells with liquid hydrogen and fuel cells at a power level of 3.2 megawatts. Um, and using liquid hydrogen, possibly storage below deck. Uh, this currently is showing storage on deck, but possibly below deck. And that would be a first in the world for a passenger vessel or basically any vessel. What's conspicuous about these pictures, though, is that there are no humans here. There's no persons, no people. Um, and that's uh, quite typical. We are engineers, and we are looking at solutions. And we come up with technology, because that's what we know. However, people are supposed to use these technologies, and they are supposed to get the maximum out of the technologies. So I'll give you uh, a few examples, some that are relatively old um, and some that are relatively new uh, and some that are really fresh. And I'll give you some examples of how the human acts in um, the setting with technology, because we are, uh, as, as uh, engineers are, are used to talking about hardware in the loop. Uh, today, it's X in the loop is, is the buzzword today, but we're putting anything in the loop. Um, and most of the time, we're forgetting the human in the loop. So we're thinking that we can make optimized systems. We can talk about how to optimize efficiency for vessels and so on if we just use the right technology. And we don't necessarily get those results if we forget that humans are still at the helm when it comes to vessels.
The human in the loop is quite important. I'll go a few years back. This is a picture. This is one of the beautiful uh, high-speed ferries uh, uh, crossing the Trondheim Fjord. It's a crossing of about 10 kilometers. Um, and it uh, uh, operates at speeds around uh, 30 knots. Uh, a relatively short crossing. Uh, we have some, uh, some longer uh, crossings as well, or, or longer travels uh, up to, I think it's three hour travel time going to, to some of the uh, farthest distances. What happened when these um, vessels were new? This is, a, this is a, a fresh picture of one of the vessels uh, operating in the Trondheim Fjord uh, today. But uh, when uh, we had the first vessels that went uh, to high speed, uh, they were fitted with engines that were derived from trucks. Uh, anyone with uh, uh, knowledge about engines and operating profiles and so on would, would know that trucks, even though they are called heavy duty uh, vehicles, um, have a different operating profile from a vessel. So the designers of the vessel, they um, took that into account and they put these um, marinized truck engines into the hull because they were able, uh, they were operating at high revolutions per minute and were able to give the performance you need on the propellers to bring these vessels up to the desired speeds. However, the designers, they said that uh, in order to do this in a proper way, the vessel should be um, operated according to a profile where the captain should leave the dock uh, at a low speed, move into open waters and then gradually open the throttle and bringing the, uh, the vessel into plane and um, into its operating speed. So gradually accelerating. Um, after a while, they experienced uh, that uh, these engines started to seize. Uh, they had a lot of seizures in engines, which means the pistons basically overheat, expand, and then get more or less welded to the piston liner inside the engine with catastrophic effects. So it destroys the engine. Um, the first idea was that, uh, and, and from all of the experts, uh, they said that, well, you tried to marinize a truck engine. Of course, it didn't work. So they said it's a technological problem, which is partly true. However, when they started looking into uh, more detail, they found that the crews were not operating the vessels as the designers had set out. So the crews, they would take the vessel out at relatively high speed from the dock already, until they saw open waters and then they would go full open throttle uh, to bring the, the vessel uh, up to speed as quickly as possible. Now, the question is then, why did they do this? And uh, in, in this case, the reason was, first of all, they were unaware that the designers had actually uh, put up this requirement that the vessel should be accelerated slowly. Uh, and they had a schedule to, to uh, keep. Uh, a quite a tight schedule and every crew knew that if the weather or the currents or the wind changed a little bit, they might be delayed. So the best thing would be to go open throttle full speed and then maybe uh, you could slow down when you, when you got closer to the other side and saw that you had some time to spare. But, but a lot of the time they were experiencing that they needed to go full speed uh, from the very beginning in order to, to maintain their schedule. Quite interesting. Um, this has been rectified. And of course, these new vessels are fitted with uh, dedicated uh, uh, marine engines, and they're operating uh, differently. But today, they are actually uh, taking into account the fact that engines need to be brought up to speed in a relatively um, um, mannered fashion, more or less. So, so you need to take that into account. Another part uh, which relates to a lot of different type of vessels and different type of operations. I'm using here uh, an example from uh, DOF uh, operating uh, quite advanced uh, vessels. Uh, the vessel you're looking at uh, is Skande Vega and uh, she is a uh, anchor handling and tug and supply vessel. So it's a multi-purpose vessel. So she does anchor handling, which is uh, which are very specific operations. They uh, take the anchors of mobile offshore units and position the anchors for these units uh, before, prior to operation and also after operation before uh, operating as a tug 
and moving the mobile offshore unit to another place of operation or taking it uh, to shore. Uh, and they can also operate as uh, supply vessels for platforms. They have a wide range of uh, complex capabilities and they have very complex machinery systems and other systems as well. Uh, and they are capable, they're built to be very energy efficient. However, when DOF started looking into the performance of these vessels, they found a huge variation between crews. So they could see that some crews were able to operate the, uh, the vessel very efficiently and others did not. And they started looking into why is this? And uh, what they came up with was uh, a, a diverse range of reasons for why the, the um, uh, crews could not do this. And uh, some of these reasons was that, uh, for instance, uh, one captain felt safer if he had more engines online that is up and running, while other captains adhered to the company policy of keeping a minimum of engines up and running. Um, that would affect your uh, fuel consumption quite much if you do that. Some vessels uh, would uh, um, be hard on the um, dynamic positioning system, keeping the vessel hard in place in position, and other captains would let the vessel drift a little bit in, in a circle or, uh, bit, uh, or uh, in and out of its position. So let it have more slack. And there were a lot of different reasons for this. Um, we also know that ferry operators in, in Norway have seen uh, differences in experienced captains, captains with uh, uh, a sailing experience of more than uh, 30 years. And they see the difference in operating the exact same ferry on the exact same route of up to 10 to 15% in fuel consumption. Um, based on the ideas and the philosophies that uh, these captains have when they operate the vessel. I said I was also going to talk a little bit about risk and, 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 and uh, risk uh, and how this comes into play when it comes to the human factor. These are pictures from three, um, two quite recent incidents in Norway with battery, battery electric vehicle uh, or vessels and one uh, that has uh, basically gone below the radar for most people when it comes to battery operated vehicles. Now, I'll start with uh, the last one first. It's down in the right corner. It's a tug, battery operated, using batteries from Corvus and lithium-based batteries. It experienced a fire on board. Um, and um, uh, the fire turned out to be quite hard to extinguish. Um, uh, the uh, reason for the fire was uh, that some of these batteries were short-circuited and started a thermal runaway situation with the batteries. The uh, problem, uh, the battery fire was put out eventually and the problem was rectified and the vessel is still operating as a, a, a battery electric uh, powered uh, vessel and uh, is in good shape. But this went under the radar. This was kind of an industrial secret, more or less. Uh, then we had an incident with a ferry, um, which caught fire in its battery compartment just prior to landing. So it was uh, almost before it, it reached shore, a fire started in the battery compartment. So they got to shore, they got every passenger, all personnel on shore and, and safe, nobody was hurt. And the fire department was called to, uh, to put out the fire and help them fix, uh, fix the problem. And the fire department arrived, they went into the compartment and they uh, put out the fire. Uh, the fire uh, sprinkling system on board was also in operation and uh, uh, everything looked good. And the fire department, there was smoke billowing out, there was heat already uh, or, or still in the system. So the fire department stayed. Uh, this happened uh, late at night and uh, the fire department stayed on site overnight. And in the morning, the next day, there were quite a few explosions on board. Uh, and the fire started again and it was quite uh, heavy and uh, they actually spent quite a few days to put it out. We also have an exploration or a, a catamaran that's operating. It's a, it's a sightseeing vessel in the Oslo fjord called Brim, who recently also um, uh, experienced a fire on board uh, and it's a battery operated vessel. Uh, the um, uh, reports from both of these incidents from the Ytterøyningen, the ferry, 
um, basically shows that uh, uh, there, uh, the, the batteries used on board were water cooled. And what happened was that the water cooling uh, had a leak. So uh, water came into contact with the batteries, made a short circuit inside the battery and started the fire. So there was a, 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 an arcing uh, in the battery, producing heat, starting the fire. And that was what happened. But the, the, the dangerous part of it was that uh, this part of the battery was not in use. It had been disconnected from the system. And what happened when it was disconnected is that the battery management system was also disconnected, uh, which meant that the people, the crew on board, never got the message that something was going on. So the fire alarm came very, very, very late and uh, much too late to be handled. And the result was uh, quite spectacular. The explosions were quite heavy and it got a lot of media attention. And that has led to both crews and passengers being quite apprehensive of the safety of battery operated vessels. Because as everybody is saying, this vessel caught fire just prior to landing. Everybody got uh, uh, onshore safe. What would happen if weather was bad, this happened uh, far from land, and uh, nobody was there to help them? That would be a very different uh, scenario. And with those explosions, people would be hurt or even killed. Um, the same thing with Brim. Uh, the fire started, uh, they spent several days trying to put the fire out from the batteries. Eventually they were uh, able to do it, but they put it also at key site in Oslo. And uh, fires from batteries uh, turn out to uh, produce quite toxic um, uh, fumes. So the uh, uh, end result is that uh, you get people with uh, quite apprehensive uh, emotions surrounding battery te technology. Now, finally, I will just have a, a short slide, which really goes back to the other uh, previous slide I had when I was talking about the anchor handling tug supply vessel. Um, together with uh, Kongsberg Maritime and uh, DOF, uh, uh, we are performing a, a project called Intelligent Energy, and that is for providing decision support for these advanced vessels, because we have realized, based on the surveys that DOF uh, has done, that crews are basically relatively unable to uh, utilize all of the capabilities of these advanced vessels. They are too advanced, basically. They're too complex and too advanced for the crews to really be able to manage them in uh, a good way. So they need systems to help them understand and increase their situational awareness, understand how they are operating the vessel right now and what is the potential to reduce energy use even further while staying within the required safety margins and so on. Um, it's very uh, interesting to see uh, the um, uh, information and how you can condense the information and how much you, you need to condense the information to make sure that the human stays in the loop and the human is able to utilize these type of systems and, uh, and uh, ensure that the goals that we set when we are engineers coming up with a lot of technological solutions, a lot of possibilities of um, um, optimizing uh, energy use on board vessels, reducing emissions by doing the right thing. Technology can take us only so far, but we need to know that the human is actually here in order to also be able to work with these complex systems. So that was um, the talk that I was uh, uh, giving today and uh, giving you some uh, thoughts, some ideas. And uh, as I said, Juno Lambeck will also come into uh, uh, to this with uh, quite a few examples on how humans perform uh, in a technological world. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Anders, on this uh, interesting presentation. Uh, before uh, continuing with other uh, lecturers, I would like to ask you a few questions which uh, should be interest interesting for our uh, audience. Yes. Uh, 
uh, when you consider uh, these new technologies, batteries or hydrogen, uh, which of them should be easier to, for uh, our crew or uh, people to accept in terms of safety and uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. I think that uh, from a Norwegian perspective, uh, one of the things I didn't show here is that we had an incident in, uh, uh, with a car refueling station for hydrogen um, uh, at a location quite close to Oslo, uh, densely populated area, where uh, there was basically an explosion, quite a, a, a heavy explosion. Uh, fortunately, it happened on a Sunday uh, very few people around. Nobody got hurt. Uh, the station was uh, was uh, uh, destroyed, and uh, they found the reason for for uh, why the explosion happened. And uh, uh, the remedy that was put into place was to shut down all hydrogen filling stations uh, in Norway. Uh, it got a lot of publicity and of course having an explosion is something that catches people's imagination and also uh, sets people to, to be quite apprehensive towards the technology. I think that when it comes to batteries, the situation is quite different because uh, we have a quite special situation in Norway with uh, uh, electric vehicles, so electric cars. Uh, you probably heard about uh, the tax levies that we get on, on uh, buying electric cars and today uh, close to 20% of the entire um, car uh, pool in Norway is uh, battery electric and more than half of uh, new car sales is battery electric. So people are, are quite familiar with battery systems or, or they feel quite familiar with them. Uh, very little incidents, uh, people feel they are safe. And even though with the, with the, the um, incidents with the ferry, uh, I think that uh, the crews are seeing that, okay, we figure out how we can alleviate these problems. Uh, we know a little bit about the design faults uh, in these systems uh, that led to the fire and what can be done in order to, to reduce the risk quite, quite a bit. And uh, also, um, uh, the, the reason was, was basically, uh, the reason for the explosion, I don't think I mentioned it, but the reason for the explosion was that um, the sprinkling of the batteries was with salt water. So <laughs> you sprinkle an electric charge system with salt water. Uh, that necessarily needs to be uh, to end with disaster. I think everybody understands that. So uh, that was the reason why it exploded. But um, uh, I think that uh, in Norway, people feel relatively comfortable around battery electric systems because of the situation with cars yeah, uh, yeah and they, they feel very uncomfortable today with hydrogen systems because of the explosion close to Oslo so yeah it, it yeah. has to do it's, it's not necessarily objective risk it's not necessarily the the actual risk it's more of the perceived risk yeah, yeah that was actually uh, my thought uh, because we see that in road transportation companies uh, like uh, Tesla or um, other companies from China make uh, battery electric vehicles and they are really there. We see that uh, the numbers are going up and uh, maybe people and the world is uh, currently um, feeling more acceptable to batteries than, uh, than, uh, than, than, than of the hydro hydrogen technology. But uh, also uh, we see a lot of explosions of batteries as well. Yes. Yeah. There are definitely uh, uh, there are definitely issues with that as well, but I mean uh, uh, I, I don't think any technology goes clear of, of uh, fires or explosions uh, when it comes to energy systems at least. Yeah. Okay, uh, we have few questions in chat, uh, we, but we will an answer them after uh, all presentations. Now, uh, uh, please, yeah, stop sharing, uh, Carlo. You can uh, jump in. The floor is yours. Please share your presentation and tell us more about uh, our survey. And the floor is yours. Okay, just a second. Share screen.
is the full screen now. Yeah, everything is okay. You can start. Okay, great. Hello to everyone. My name is Carlos Trunje. I am working in Center of Technology Transfer and I am a project junior engineer on ZEV Innovation Project. I will take a little bit of your time for just a short survey for short four questions. Uh, like the, like Laura said before, the aim of the of ZEV Innovation Project is to develop and build a platform to support and encourage collaboration is in the in the development of zero emission vessels and related technologies. Uh, your answers on our questions uh, will helping us develop and shape uh, the innovation hub, identify and connect collaboration partners and identify collaborative innovation opportunities. All information collected will be kept uh, con confidential. Uh, so uh, for this survey, uh, to be able to answer these questions, uh, you need your phones uh, to scan QR code on your left up, uh, upper corner, or you, uh, with computer, you can go on slido.com and write uh, this code under hashtag 247079. So I think there will be no problem with getting slider.com. We will uh, wait a half a minute, minute to everybody get in. So we can then start with questions. Laura will also uh, write a link in chat and code, so you can go on that link and get in. Yeah, the link is in the chat. Uh, you can click on it. Uh, the code is also there, or just uh, scan a QR code. So for question is, do any of your current collaboration projects uh, involve collaborating with organization in other countries? We have five answers at the moment and answer is 100% yes. We will wait, wait a little bit more answers. We have more than 10 people at the moment on slide.com. So please answer. Okay, great, everybody answers uh, on this first question. So we can go on second. In your organization is involved in current collaboration projects. Who are the collaboration partners? Uh, it, it is a multiple choices. Uh, so you can answer or a uh, few, you, you can have a few answers. Okay. I would like to I would like to add that uh, these questions are uh, really important to us because uh, your answers uh, means a lot and uh, your answers will help us to develop uh, a better platform, a better hub and, and eventually it will help uh, to our project that it uh, will be uh, successful at the end. So please you, take the time yes. 
Yeah. We have different answers on this question. So, but uh, everybody answers uh, answer that research institutions, RID labs. So, okay, we can go on second, on third question. What behavior values are important to you when selecting a collaboration partner? Also, you, you can have a multiple choice. Yeah, the answer are coming. Yes. That's, that's good. Great. Um, great yes. We see that the reliability, reliability good communication. Yeah. And I, I, I could also add that we have uh, just five partners. That's uh, not a lot, but uh, uh, that's helping us to be active and to uh, to everyone uh, that everyone uh, communicate uh, via email and uh, we are uh, all uh, into the progress, we are monitoring the project and that uh, helps us a, a lot. So we have uh, 10 answers, uh, reliability is 90% answer so we have different answers but reliability is the most so we can go on the last question what processes if any does the organization have in place for managing collaboration projects We have five answers. We will wait a little bit more so everybody answer. At the moment, regular meetings and workshops are 90% answered. That's just okay. Okay, 10 participants answered all questions so uh that's it that's uh, four short questions for me uh thank you very much for your little bit time uh these answers will helping a lot in uh, develop and build our platform uh, to support and encourage collaboration in development of zero emission vessels and related technologies if you have some questions for me you can uh, write email uh, me or to my company and thank you very much one more time. And I hope you will enjoy your next uh, presentations. Lauro. Thank you, Carlo. Thank you, Carlo. Uh, I hope that uh, received, we received enough uh, questions. Uh, I now invite uh, Gunnar Lanvik uh, to join and to share his presentation and tell us uh, more about uh, his, work, his work in Sintef. Thank you very much. Uh, let me now see. We are, yeah, it started sharing. Just a second. Yeah, we now see your presentation. In a presentation mode or? Uh, no, it's still not in a presentation mode. You but can try. Perhaps... Yeah, now, now it's fine. Now it's fine. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Great. Perfect. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you for inviting me into this forum and uh, very interesting uh, topic, definitely. Uh, I will uh, give a presentation around, around cultural variation and work practice. And, uh, and 
and culture in three different ways, actually, national, professional, and organizational culture. I will give some examples later on. Uh, this is me, Gunnar Lamik. I have a PhD in social anthropology from, uh, the, from uh, the university in Trondheim, which was uh, pivoting around Filipino seafarers in the Norwegian International Fleet. So I used to live in the Philippines in 95, 96, and been back and forth many, many times to to Philippines in different uh, projects and errands. Uh, uh, I think 16 or 17 times I've been to the Philippines. I have, I'm a senior researcher in Sintef the last 20 years. So I'm, I'm employed the year before Anders, uh, it seems. Uh, in, uh, and over the years, I've been involved in a long range of, uh, of um, uh, R&D projects in within the maritime and oil and gas industry. Uh, uh, topics, typical topics has been managerial practices, training, national authorities, trade union subjects, and HSC situation in shipping and offshore industry. But uh, it has been a variety of projects uh, over the years in Sintef, but uh, most of them have been around cultural differences, work practice, and safety. So uh, this is from Singapore when, when we had two years in a row actually invited to, to address uh, cultural uh, uh, issues in, in uh, by the Houston worldwide offshore converted some of their vessels of uh, super tankers into uh, FPSOs. Uh, and this is my man, uh, so to speak, uh, the Filipino seafarers. Uh, uh, and, but also, uh, we also have some land-based projects over the years. In, in this is a welder from, from uh, uh, I think, from, from Trøndelag, from our region. Uh, and over the last years, we also had a very interesting and relevant project to mention in this uh, forum. Uh, is um, we had a, a, a relevant, uh, interesting projects project around the company called Jotun. Uh, uh, the paint factory. So we visited the uh, uh, paint factories in China and Dubai, Oman, Spain, and UK and Norway. Uh, this and uh, the 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 fishermen here. We also had some over the years uh, a very interesting. Uh, uh, in one particular com uh, project I, I, I will address is that uh, this guy on, on his ship fishing vessel is the most dangerous working place in Norway. During the 90s, they, uh, all of them, uh, it, had, it, it, uh, it was uh, 100 casualties in, in, uh, in the Norwegian fisheries alone on this type of vessel. It's called Schalke Norwegian. I think it's in English, it's called Smack or something. And they fish very often alone. And uh, and if you compare 10 in, in 10 per year, and if you compare it with the total amount, so th I think they were around 5,500 people who was into this business. So extremely dangerous. But this is perhaps the, the most, uh, uh, significant project for me the last years. It, uh, it, I, I was uh, in charge for uh, comparing the HSC level in Southeast Asia and, and, and the North Sea. And uh, uh, on uh, th this picture is outside Borneo and uh, you know, Norwegian owned but locally manned uh, oil rig, dr drilling rig. And the, the last one I will mention is that the last year we had the evaluation for Equinor uh, on, on uh, ISS uh, service, uh, services. I will come back to this later on. But the vessel is not just another construction, it's definitely I have, have a potential to be an extremely powerful metaphor. It's very often a metaphor of life and uh, and, and as Michel Foucault said, it's in civilization without boats, dreams dry up. 
and uh, you have a drilling vessel uh, you hear here and you have a Bergusten super tanker and then the, the the left corner is the picture taken by me actually it's in the Mediterranean on a cargo vessel but uh, uh, what what I will address is that uh, there is a link between where people come from and how they do their work there is a link between the the color of the passport and how they solve the tasks whether it's offshore or or on board a vessel or elsewhere but luckily uh, or uh, it's not that clear cut as you see the the red arrow here but because cultural differences is definitely a sensitive issue uh, uh, the, as on the shed I, I will i'm not an engineer so as you saw i am a social anthropologist and but uh, but culture needs a sober treatment. This is not about nuts and bolts. It's a great social and individual variation. And culture unites and divides us versus them. As and we we have all been uh, so, uh, the term often used as explanatory tool for everything. Oh, it's the typical Norwegian, typical uh, Filipino to do this and that. But we are all equal, but some are more equal than others. And, uh, and the focus will be, this is def actually a, a definition, one of the potent, one of the many uh, definitions of culture is the focus will be upon the basic assumption taken for granted beliefs and values that is shared in the population. But the meaning of work differs across cultures. Uh, work, and, and, and as uh, suggested already, work is definitely serious matters. It's not just a question of income. We all want to gain respect and recognition as professionals. We all want to do a proper job. However, this does not mean the same. It in place implies different behavior. So to be a welder in, in the Croatia or Singapore or Norway means different things. Technically the same, but different ways to think of and perform the role, different meaning imposed into the, into, into the work. The picture is from a shipyard in Singapore. But this, this is a good uh, example to, to, to think with, so to speak. The Filipino seafarers, which I know most of actually, uh, or my uh, and, and maintenance and what is maintenance it's when it's done properly it's it, it's invisible it's abstract and invisible work if you replace the 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 spare part and uh, before it's uh, ruined or destroyed or uh, then no one has actually seen that you have done the, the work so uh, and yeah but this challenges a certain Filipino values and taken for granted ideas, because deeply rooted in the Philippine culture lays the idea that you become a person through in constantly involving yourself in new projects. You're not worth more than your last project. So it typically in, in the countryside in, in the Philippines, you can see uh, on the basketball court for something new, and then the local politicians has has uh, written uh, this is where your tax money goes so so people feel they that they pay tax not in vain but uh, yeah but uh, and a Norwegian superintendent I've also seen it myself tell stories about engine rooms where Filipinos are in charge that it's definitely a quick fix and improvisation and what is emphasized is the the highly whistleblower work so you paint up the, 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 some of the pipes, threads, uh, and report of light bulbs or, and things like that. A different work practice, diff different safety performance. And safety is definitely one important, although, uh, aspect of, of work practice. We all want a safe operation. We all want to avoid accidents to happen and to become to come more home to our beloved ones back home. However, it seems that we have different ways of strategies to reach this goal. So cultural influence influence the work practice and 
and th thus the safety level in an operation. The culture provides us with different starting points for a safe work practice. Uh, although all everyone knows or in implicitly knows that there is a, a link between where people come from and how they do the work. It's surprisingly scarce data or literature on this field, despite phenomena as migration and globalization. And I'm, I'm sure some of you, or maybe all of you have heard of Hofstede, for example, uh, and Trompenar, and, but the Hofstede is maybe, is maybe the major actor in, in this. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, Helmreich and Murit, uh, which is psychologists from Austin, I think, I, I, I think so, they have uh, given, they're based on Hofstede's work, they have uh, published a book in 98 called Culture at Work in Aviation and Medicine. So aviation, uh, and they, uh, their topic was uh, um, from the cover the period from 93 to 97, 15,000 pilots, 63, uh, 36 airlines and 23 countries. So, yeah, okay, the, this, uh, this to compare, for example, safety performance with Southeast Asia and the North Asia is of course a huge challenge. As I said, when I, I we, we went to several, uh, uh, rig visits in, in the Southeast Asia, Asia. And, and even I brought people from Statoil, as I said, uh, or, and from the maritime, uh, or from the petroleum authorities in Norway, they joined me for a visit and they were, were impressed by the, the, the HSC level. But you are not supposed to say, tell the Norwegian oil and the gas, gas community that that is impossible to that it's possible to, to gain uh, excellent HSE results without, with a lower investments as they, they same do. So the, 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 the immediate reaction by the Norwegian community, oil community was that it's under reporting and climate, it can't be true. But eventually, as I said, I brought with me people from, from the oil majors and authorities and they were impressed. But of course, apples and pears is extremely difficult to task, no statistics to rely on. So it's a, a national culture in anthropology, in my discipline, it's hardly exist. So to link to, to link culture to, to a certain territory is one thing, but to, to give culture to a political association is, an, is a challenge. But a professional culture, uh, it can be a much stronger bond than both national and organizational identity. And once again, shared norms and values in a profession. And, and here we have a professional culture in aviation and based on the, the authors I mentioned re recently. Tw uh, 12,000 pilots in 19 countries. Uh, and, and here is one, uh, do you see my cursor? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, I like my job. Uh, quite an innocent uh, question, but after all, uh, all of them, all of these uh, 12,500 pilots and from 19 countries, they agree. Uh, it's, it's a quite good work to be, a uh, position to be a pilot. So after all, if you are from uh, Philippines, Korea, or, or Germany, they 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 will accept uh, uh, that it, it's 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 uh, um, it, it's a meaningful job. Yeah, this. Uh, uh, now we have seen uh, the, the link between national culture and work practice, but we also have seamanship. Uh, it's a, it's a mythical term, actually, but uh, uh, one uh, professor from Denmark, uh, Fabienne Knudsen, she defined it that uh, uh, it's a blend of professional knowledge, professional pride, and experience-based common sense. 
uh, as well as having a social and ethical dimension. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, we had the project where we, we're pivoting around the, the design of the bridge and especially uh, when they uh, eventually after some years they had to replace some equipment and and I think uh, the, the the backdrop is that uh, uh, a bridge uh, in on board a vessel is some kind of compromise. It's based on different uh, lev uh, producers, manufacturers, and and uh, yeah, different manufacturers, small and in, as, uh, uh, in inadjustable text made on the screens, several screens without ding function, uh, equipment that could not be reached from a normal working position, handles without feedback, and many non-functional buttons, buttons. And of course, uh, uh, it's no uh, secret that this picture is from, uh, from the Coastal Express in, in Norway, from Bergen to Kirkenes. Uh, and uh, and the, the, uh, uh, I was surprised that the, the captain on the bridge here, if some of the passengers uh, 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 having a shower, and some of the the, the humid humidity in into the uh, cabin, then then uh, uh, alarm potentially can start. And he on on the bridge will have all the the cabins into the. So in in the end, it's a fatigue when it comes to to or they ignore uh, the, the some of the alarms at least. But I mean, here we have some. Uh, concrete illustrations of seamanship. Uh, you see here, uh, I think the, the, the mouse is not supposed to be there, but they have put some plexiglass over. And you see, uh, they have just made a hole to the buttons they, they need. Uh, and here, some of the officers, a woman, she was not that tall as the rest one, so she had to stand on something when they entered the port. And this is my one of my favorites. Uh, everything is ignored except for start and stop all wipers. And of course, this is also uh, one. I mean, uh, the policy in, in the company can change over the years. And and uh, and when when the electrician come on board and to to fix the new equipment, for, for example, this is the, from the fuel fuel control monitor the fuel consumption. Then they just put it somewhere. I mean, it's not that uh, many places to choose either. So it 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 it, it is, um, and you you see also some of the other muffs they use just to ignore. And because one of the definitely, as I mentioned, it's very hard. I mean, during winter time, and it's supposed to be extremely dark. Uh, I mean, outside, and you need to 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 have a not to ignore or destroy your night vision it's it's impossible to dim some of the fully fully uh, this is from a supply vessel outside the uh, offshore insulation in the north sea so now we have seen uh, the professional culture and uh, the national culture but we we'll also have a last example is that it can also be a uh, uh, it can also be uh, as, as a, a sim a asymmetry in a community of practice may also generate cultural var variation and then different work practice. Uh, and this is an example from the from the HSC platform we evaluated uh, last year. Uh, and it's ESS I I illustration. I will come back to what ESS stands for. But uh, but immediately it's in it's easy to understand that inside one particular company company it's a, it is a poten potential for variation. I mean managers versus employee is one example, but you also have a a, a different a, a variation between between the companies in in the same sector, collaboration and dependencies, and of course how are you employed is 
are you uh, uh, fixed employment or uh, on, on, on a contract hired? So ISS is definitely the underdog uh, uh, offshore. And, and ISS means uh, I, ISS disciplines is insulation, scaffolding, and surface treatment. And the, the companies, uh, we, uh, it's no secret, <laughs> they are the biggest in, in Anosi, uh, Kefer, Bilfinger, Linjebyg, and Berenberg. And they are all uh, hired or uh, on contracts by Equinor, so, uh, and the oil major. So, Um, but common for all these organizations, all these ISS companies, is that they, have, they are uh, the big part in the collaboration. They, have, they may have long framework contracts, but they have constantly, but they are constantly re renegotiated. I mean, some of the companies, they had a contract with Equinor from, from now to uh, 2031. But you need to constantly prove that you are you are the one for the job. So maybe uh, annually or every second year you have to renegotiate re the, the the contract. So it's it, it's 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 a strange um, arrangement actually. And ISS work is definitely physically demanding, very noise, gas exposed, uh, and relatively low salary. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the offshore industry is not known for their low salary in, in Norway, uh, uh, um, but, uh, uh, and they also have unclear contracts regarding job rotation. Uh, I have some neighbors here in Trondheim who has been into this for a sh short peri period, but, but uh, when you are not... Uh, when you don't know you are, you, then when you can come back again, then you just uh, leave the, the ISS business. And as Mandy do it, then high, very high turnover. So, uh, 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 I think one third of every people, every man is definitely mostly men, uh, are a new, are new uh, newcomers. And uh, this is actually my last, I think my last slide, uh, cultural differences and hierarchy. So the totality of this, all these structural factors, generous and infer inferior attitude among ESS employees. So wh wh whether you work in Equinor or in an ISS company will influence on how you look upon the work and how you interact on board. And this is a huge dilemma for the operating company, as, as you probably know. I mean, uh, HSC is the priority number one in, in offshore industry. Uh, so uh, a huge accident or will be, will be a, a catastrophe for most, uh, uh, mo not only for the people who, who are ever, who die or, uh, or the, the pollution, but, uh, and, and, and the Equinor people, in this case, they, they are mostly civil engineers, but, uh, or some, some, uh, uh, some uh, also, uh, but who, who is actually doing the, the, the dangerous work? Well, it's ISS companies. So if one accident in ISS company can may destroy or ruin the, the whole uh, operation. So, so the, the, the dilemma for, in this case, uh, Equinor is how to include a line, ensure that ISS company for real come up with the operational concerns that eventually may challenge or threaten the success of the whole operation. So they, they, they work very, very closely on offshore, but, but still, um, uh, That's it. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Gunnar. The presentation was uh, really interesting. Uh, 
I have a few questions for you uh, regarding, um, I, I would like to connect uh, Anders presentation and your presentation. Mm. So if we consider vessels uh, that, that, are, uh, that are unmanned, that, that do not have people on board, mm -hmm. and uh, let's say consider artificial intelligence and uh, the autonom autonomous sailing, Mm -hmm. um, should we and how uh, uh, can it be done? How, how could we include cu cultural variations across uh, across uh, different countries into into such technology? Be because uh, such technology uh, it it uh, depends already uh, upon a, a lot of factors, and this could be really an additional problem. Yeah. Well, Anders is more closely working with autonomous vessels, I think. Uh, but but uh, uh, but when you consider, uh, but uh, for, from your your point of view, yeah. should we include uh, such a cu cultural variation yeah. because they 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 do exist? They do they do definitely exist. Uh, yeah uh, yeah yeah. Uh, I think also. I mean, uh, I, I'm not. Um, uh, I think it's it, it, autonomous vessel has been uh, or still is a very hype. <laughs> I, 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 I would like to see uh, uh, um, uh, as long as you find people who accept to being offshore on, on, on board for 10 months a, a row per year, then it's very difficult to, to see the, the large amount of autonomous vessel, but but uh, 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 I know that uh, in in Norway you have some uh, some really uh, full scale experiments or even uh, as as we speak uh, in in uh, in uh, with Kongsberg Maritime and uh, Willemsen have a joint venture called Masterly, for example. So they 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 are they are convinced that uh, that uh, this is is coming. But I I would suggest maybe some of you know better than me. But I think we will have parallel universes. You will have some high tech autonomous vessels or or maybe ferries is uh, what's coming first, and then you have uh, as long uh, as uh, as long as you find. Uh, uh, labor that can uh, accept the terms, then they will have that one uh, as well. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I can sorry. maybe yeah. chip in a little bit. Yeah, um, please. Because what you were mentioning now last is um, uh, autonomous uh, ferries um, and. Um, from the maritime uh, authority in Norway, uh, they see autonomous ferries as one of the first actual uh, big um, application areas for uh, autonomous vessels. Now, it's it's also uh, quite important to understand that um, this uh, term autonomy uh, is uh, something that uh, is a, a gradual um, uh, development from fully manual to what you might consider just totally automated, where there's no human in the loop whatsoever. And most of the systems that we are today talking about as, uh, as uh, autonomous systems is somewhere in between. So uh, even if you look at the Yara Birkeland, uh, which will be a, a very small vessel con uh, container vessel operating autonomously in uh, the Oslo Fjord, uh, has quite a lot of human interaction in, in uh, its operation. Um, <clears throat> even though the vessel itself might be able to navigate the area uh, autonomously. Um, but uh, ferries uh, is a good example because uh, there you have the issue of having a, a vessel. Uh, if, if you look at ferry operations in Norway, they usually cross a, go across a fjord. Uh, travel time is something like uh, anything from 10 minutes to, uh, to up to an hour uh, crossing time. And uh, uh, today, the manual operation on, the, on these very new uh, uh, ferries that have been put into operation is 
manual operation is in and out of uh, of the harbor or, or of the the landing area. So the captain takes the vessel from uh, the quayside out into the fjord, pushes a button, and the ferry crosses the fjord by itself. And then it gives a warning saying, I'm approaching the point where I need a human to take over control and land the vessel. Um, so the next part is to automate the landing. And that's what they're working on right now. And the interesting part is what then happens to the crew? Because now you have captains who, can, who sit there, can override if they want to. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, you, you have crossings like you go across the fjord, 30 minutes crossing, you do that 10 times a day. Uh, it's the same travel. Uh, weather, of course, changes, making it uh, a little bit more exciting in uh, some days than others. But it's, it's the same monotonous, monotonous job. Now they're going to take away uh, all of the excitement uh, and, and just put the captain on top there, sitting there, monitoring everything, drinking his coffee, paying attention. Um, what happens then to, to the human? What it, what, how is the human going to interact and, and what is happening? It, I think it's a very interesting question. And um, the current safety regulations say that you need people on board. But uh, if you look at the, if you, uh, from a tech, technological point of view, I'm pretty sure that we can make the ferry sail safely uh, all by itself from one side of the fjord to the other. Um, I think it, it can be done. Uh, but, but then again, as I said, uh, the uh, uh, issue of absolute risk, what, what's the real risk and what's the perceived risk is, uh, is uh, something to, to consider. And maybe the crew on board should only be people who are there and only know how to get people safely off the vessel if something could hap uh, should happen. Um, just to mention it, um, I don't have the figure uh, in front of me, so I, could, I can't present it, but we have been working on the concept where instead of having one huge ferry crossing the fjord, we have a small ferry crossing the fjord. And every time uh, there comes more cars, so the, the cars start to pile up on the land side, you can attach more parts of the ferry. So you have some, call it a barge, that can act as a trailer to the ferry. Previously, uh, ideas such as this was that uh, these trailers needed to be physically connected. And the physical connection on a vessel in water is really difficult because the forces will be really high if you start to get waves and movement. But today with autonomy and with automation, we can actually make the trailer so the trailer follows the vessel. So it's like uh, a mother goose with all its chickens behind. So it's, it's, a, it's a flexible system because uh, right now, ferry crossings in Norway are such that, uh, for instance, here in Trondheim, one of the busiest in, in Norway, um, uh, during the middle of the day, there's almost no cars on board. Uh, but it's still the same big ferry crossing the fjord. And in the, when you come to the weekend, there's a huge lineup of cars waiting to be carried across the fjord. So if you could have a system which is flexible, where you can build the capacity based on what you have uh, on shore, and then just operate a small ferry, which is suited for this middle of the day or next to nothing uh, operation, uh, that would be interesting. So we'll see if, if that pans out, but, but that uh, is one of the examples of where you can get uh, something like something approaching autonomy, but it's basically an automated system. Um, the reason why the Maritime Directorate is skeptical towards it is uh, they don't want to put people on such a barge without having some kind of safety personnel helping them if something happens. So um, again, uh, real risk versus perceived risk is uh, quite difficult for all of us, even being engineers and, and thinking that we know statistics and, and uh, know how to be objective observers and so on. Uh, it's really hard. That's what we struggle with all the time. So. Uh, uh, thank you, Anders. Uh, I have a few more questions, but uh, we should uh, hold yeah. them hold them for the Q and A session. Uh, now I invite uh, Mr. Bitsinski from Dinia Maritime School to join us. Okay. Hi. Uh, please, uh, please. Uh, okay. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we hear we hear you very well. I now asked you to start the video because we don't do not see you. Uh, now, now it's okay. And now uh, please uh, share your screen. You have a button below. Yeah. Okay. And it's it's visible. Uh, not not yet. Yeah. Just a moment. Um, uh -huh. um, I would try, I would try, okay, then to share video, to share screen just a moment. Uh, 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 uh. Um, okay, just, just a moment, I will just, I will try. <laughs> okay. That's here. Yeah. So First of first, you open a presentation or a document. Yeah. Okay. I will, I will open doc. That's it's open. Then you open it, and then you go to the green to the button, sh share screen, and you pick a window where is where it is yeah, your okay, document okay, which you have okay. opened. Okay. I will just I will try. You know. Okay. Good. Still. It's opened. And the share screen. Yeah. Is it visible? Uh, not yet. Sure. Uh, now it's now it's uh, starting. Yeah, yeah. The presentation is uh, is now uh, shared. Very good. Uh, Mr. Bitsinski, the floor is yours. Uh, you can start. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So then I will just I will just start another presentation. Yeah. Moment. moment. Uh, Okay, from the beginning. Okay, now I think it's, everything is okay. Um, yes, yes, everything uh, is fine. Yeah, still, still good morning, and uh, I'm uh, my name is uh, Zbigniew Beczynski, and uh, I'm a master mariner and uh, electronic engineer from the Gdynia Maritime School. And the Gdynia Maritime School is uh, is engaged in. Uh, in uh, training of uh, deck and engine officers, as well as uh, as uh, offers the variety of uh, training courses for the seafarers, and we are engaged uh, also in uh, in the offshore sector. I mean, all uh, DP related uh, the training courses, and as well as uh, as uh, and wind energy offshore sector. That's just in general, and. Uh, uh, the reason, you know, uh, the, this uh, uh, presentation, I mean, uh, um, we talk about the first subject of the IGF code. Uh, it's uh, not quite a zero emission uh, system, but it's a step ahead, you know, uh, uh, to reduce uh, to reduce emissions. I mean, uh, especially, you know, uh, uh, to improve the quality of the flue gas uh, in the special areas and import areas. Uh, we have here uh, close to us the Baltic Sea, the special area when we have restrictions. Uh, this, you know, uh, the Gdynia Maritime School is engaged in this type of training since more than eight years. And, uh, uh, however, uh, the IMO has uh, decided to develop uh, uh, an uh, IGF code, the Sinatra Code for Safety for Ships Using Gases, Another low point flash point fuels. They are, you know, the in fuels uh, uh, the various liquids, but the most uh, common and most uh, uh, popular now it's uh, uh, LNG. I mean, it's a liquefied uh, natural gas. Uh, this gas produces uh, various problems with the storage on deck uh, on board of vessel. Uh, we use uh, uh, special. Uh, tanks, uh, the pressure tanks, uh, or we use, you know, uh, uh, or we use atmospheric tanks. Uh, so that that's, you know, it, uh, we observe a low when we store the gas on 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 board. It's uh, uh, we are talking about the low temperatures, which uh, produce a problem to the crew. Uh, this uh, uh, development of uh, IGF court. It's not only the technical. Not only technical uh, conditions for uh, uh, for vessels, 
but uh, the most important is uh, uh, that uh, uh, companies shall assure that seafarers on board ships using gases, uh, mostly I mean about the LNG, shall have completed the uh, training to attain abilities. You know, that's very important uh, because, you know, uh, of uh, the nature of, uh, of the fuel. Uh, this is uh, also, you know, that's included in uh, SDCW convention uh, and, and SDCW uh, code. So this is, you know, uh, uh, the training uh, according to the IGF code. However, uh, the phase two of the IGF code development is ongoing in IMO, uh, because now uh, uh, we uh, are focused on the new, uh, new, you know, uh, uh, fuel cells, you know, uh, and metal ethyl alcohols as fuel. So fuel cells we're talking, you know, about uh, with use of hydrogen, uh, and of course, metal ethyl alcohols as fuel, which uh, are not focused in the present uh, version of code. The code was implemented in January in force in 2017. The new uh, requirements uh, should be completed and uh, up to end of this year. Uh, of course, uh, we have some restrictions due to, uh, due to COVID and uh, it's planned to uh, be in force from 2024. Um, some uh, uh, some information about the training requirements. Uh, the crew, that's essentially you know, to promote safe energy banking practices. Uh, uh, that every crew member uh, should receive uh, comprehensive, comprehensive formal uh, training. Now we are talking about emergency response training to deal with conditions of leakage, spillage, or fire, and the first aid training. Uh, specific to LNG. Uh, some more uh, information about requirements of, uh, uh, of the STCW convention. Uh, we are talking about uh, two levels of uh, training. Uh, the basic training for CFARs responsible for designated safety duties associated with the current use of emergency response to the fuel on board of ship subject to IGF code. Uh, the detailed uh, provisions are uh, included in uh, section A, uh, so, uh, five slash three in the SCW and of the SCCW code. And then we have developed a special IMA model course, 7.13 for basic training. That uh, means this training is very important. Advanced training for masters, engineer officers, and all personnel uh, with <coughs> immediate responsible for the care and use, oh, sorry, sorry, and use, uh, and use uh, fuel system on ships subject to IGF code. This is also included in, uh, in the STCW code and uh, I am a model course 7.14. In the Dania Maritime School also, uh, we have implemented also approved, it should be approved by administration, uh, uh, LNG bunkering simulator. Uh, the simulator will replace two from three required bunkering uh, to complete training. Every every uh, person who passed this advanced training should uh, spend a month on board of vessel and to pass three real bunkering operations to get to be fully trained or Two of uh, from this uh, bunker operators may be uh, may be replaced by uh, proper uh, simulated training. So that's an example of the ferry boat. Uh, you may see you may see you know here you know uh, tanks on deck, position on deck, and it's a bunkering bunkering vessel, energy bunkering vessel. So this is you know a typical bunker station. Uh, bunker station will have uh, connections. Connections, you know, uh, they, we connect uh, 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 hoses, you know, to transfer uh, LNG into uh, tanks on board of vessel. You see that they are isolated. 
uh, because you know the diameter of the outside is larger than the pipe diameter and uh, they insulated uh, due to low temperature. You may, you may imagine uh, we may have from minus 31 degrees uh, when we have pressure tanks or even minus 63 degrees Celsius when we use uh, when we use uh, uh, atmospheric tanks. Uh, you know, the, the uh, capacity of tanks, it varies depends on the vessel, a small vessel from around 100 cubic meters, and on the uh, large container vessels, which are planned you know, to use LNG as fuel, we are talking about the uh, atmospheric membrane tanks of the capacity around 15,000 cubic meters. It's a huge, huge amount of uh, gas on board. Uh, for crew uh, was uh, operating on the typical cargo vessel, uh, it could be a bit strange because it's not a gas tanker carrying uh, gas as uh, as a fuel, but that's it's uh, it, oh, sorry as a cargo, but that's only the fuel which should be you know uh, used on board, and then the crew uh, should have a special approach and to take care you know for uh, possible problems and the uh, danger situation. So what we, uh, now we know uh, LNG, there was a problem for the beginning uh, when we had uh, an, uh, just a few uh, bunkering uh, uh, stations uh, worldwide, you know, in some places. Uh, the number of the bunkering uh, uh, solutions is growing. And now we have, you know, uh, more than 100. Uh, and that's the statistic from 2020. Uh, probably uh, this vessel is now we are talking about. Uh, uh, we may talk about about 200 LNG fueled vessels, but uh, at the start of 2020, it was 175, and over 200 ships in order. Uh, about 10 to 20 percent of new order uh, book is LNG fueled. That's you know. Uh, uh, what we are talking now is uh, if it will be uh, number will be increased or not, so we'll see that. The various types of vessel, uh, that's an example, car, passenger ferries, uh, cruise ships, uh, container vessels, oil chemical tankers, or OPEC, and other vessels, you know, uh, offshore supply vessels, and so on. Uh, with the LNG, uh, we are talking also, you know, not on the uh, new uh, built vessels, uh, but uh, uh, also some conversions are, you know, uh, uh, done on the on on board on, on vessels, uh, which you know uh, uh, have installed the proper uh, engines. We are talking about dual fuel engines. Usually, you know, uh, uh, this uh, uh, vessel uh, when operate on the on the open waters. Uh, outside of this uh, special areas. Uh, the vessel uh, use uh, heavy fuel or, or, or traditional or diesel. Uh, but, you know, when enter this special areas, uh, should uh, transfer, you know, uh, uh, to, uh, to LNG. Uh, the problems with, uh, with the gas is uh, to uh, ensure that we have the continuous supply of gas to the engine, especially in port area of vessels maneuvering. Uh, so just in case of, uh, of uh, any problems with the gas supply, it may happen, you know, uh, in the emergency situation. So then we have, uh, we may, uh, this automatic system will change back, you know, to the diesel in case of emergency, or we are talking now uh, about uh, uh, hybrid vessels, uh, the new projects, uh, when we may uh, use, you know, the batteries uh, as emergency supply system. So, who is involved in operation? You see, then uh, we have uh, this is a ship side, the shore side. It depends because we are talking about the various uh, uh, supply system, short terminal, truck, and uh, uh, or uh, supply vessel. The supply vessels are now uh, getting uh, more popular as a more flexible system and uh, they are, you know, they have a uh, quite uh, a large capacity. They may store uh, a large amount of gas on board, liquid gas on board. 
te trzy, trzy better solution than uh, the trucks they used, uh, they're still used, you know, on for the smaller amounts of uh, uh, gas which are supplied. So then we have, you know, from the shore side, you know, the personal, and then we have, you know, uh, from the from the from the vessel, uh, the manifold, the connection, uh, the master is responsible for all operations, of course, but the engineer. Engineers are direct, uh, uh, directly engaged in uh, in the uh, all operations related to bunkering. So then, you know, uh, what we had, what I said before, uh, the number of persons is engaged. The safety procedures, you know. We are talking about the safety procedures because it's not the uh, same as bunkering of, uh, of uh, uh, heavy fuel or diesel. It's a big different. Uh, so then uh, we have to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, an uh, cooperation. Uh, we have to have effective means of communication between uh, the responsible uh, operators uh, and supervisors on the ship and onshore bunker station, a truck or, or bunker vessel. So that should be, that's very important. That's the human factor, you know, and, uh, because uh, should be a good communication to act in case of emergency, you know. So we have even installed for them uh, emergency shutdown systems on board just in case of any problems. Uh, then we have to establish a safety and security zone. Uh, you know, a route of the vessel, just in case of leakage, in case of the leakage of uh, liquefied gas into the water, that we may observe, you know, a rapid, you know, uh, uh, change of the liquid into the into the vapor, and in case of the proper uh, relation between the vapor and uh, and uh, and uh, oxygen, that's a, it's a risk, you know, of even explosion. So that's that's very dangerous. So we have we have you know to be uh, ready to act, and then we have to protect you know vessel uh, should uh, be a proper distance uh, from the other ships, an authorized person in the area, objects like cars, uh, trucks, as uh, even cranes you know uh, in port area, and ignition sources. Uh, during uh, bunkering operations, every crew member must follow all restrictions established. You know it's. Uh, movement on uh, uh, board is restricted uh, that we have to take care you know uh, for uh, uh, protection of uh, accommodation areas uh, in case of uh, you know and the presence of gas in in in, in air we have to take care in case if we have some uh, uh, bad weather condition like uh, let's say like uh, 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 thunders you know i mean uh, uh, and uh, uh, that that's which may uh, be a risk of of uh, an ignition. Uh, it produces serious problem in particular on ferries and crew vessels. In a ferry, uh, when we are alongside, you know, when we are uh, we have to to uh, to supply gas as a bunker. Uh, at the same time, you know, because uh, the time uh, alongside is limited, usually it's uh, one two hours alongside, you know. Uh, so that we have to at the same time we have. Uh, to uh, uh, to uh, you know uh, to board you know uh, passengers we have to board uh, uh, vehicles on board uh, so that that's you know uh, the all operation must be done you know within the same time you know, that's produced uh, an additional risk uh, and we have to take care of this uh, and the cruise vessels when we have passengers uh, and the passenger movement uh, when uh, uh, when uh, at the same time, you know, uh, uh, we are bunkering. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, passenger movement must be controlled by the crew uh, to protect passengers against a very potential danger situation. However, you know, for the cruise vessels uh, to use LNG is now uh, uh, an attractive because they may, uh, okay, now we have. Uh, we we'll have COVID and, uh, and uh, the operations are, uh, are very limited. Uh, but, you know, uh, before this and probably will be in the future, you know, the vessels may enter, you know, uh, uh, the restricted areas. It means when they close to the, to, the, to the ports, you know, or attractive areas 
and saving, you know, uh, environment against against of uh, what I'm talking dirty flue gas. Uh, the very important, uh, it's a risk assessment, uh, which should be, you know, uh, uh, taken under consideration and uh, has an influence on the preparator, uh, preparation uh, of the approved bunker plan. So that's, uh, you know, an example, you know, of, uh, uh, when the vessel is alongside, then we have here the hose cutter, here is a truck. Now then we have, you know, uh, safety zone, the safety zone, usually it's, you know, uh, uh, 50, 60, uh, depends on the meters, and the hazardous areas, you know, when, uh, uh, which is potentially dangerous in case of energy, it it's depends of the, of the situation, you know, uh, uh, of the weather condition, it, it could be a few hundred meters, you know, of the vessel. And it's, of course, all the other vessels alongside are excluded. So that's uh, additional problem uh, uh, because we have to find a special uh, area in port to be designated for bunker operations. Uh, this is, you know, uh, uh, the problem with the risk assessment, what we have to uh, analyze, you know, uh, uh, so that we have, you know, uh, uh, depends on the bank rank uh, uh, option. We have described very carefully operations, uh, potential hazard to identify, and the hazard possible. So that's the, that's uh, the analysis we should do, you know, to uh, to uh, make a proper uh, make a proper, you know, uh, uh, bank rank uh, plan. Uh, the integral part of this uh, are the special, very, uh, you know. Uh, uh, a special checklist. Uh, this checklist, you know, they have a number of parts. You know, we should uh, we should you know uh, uh, do this. You know, prepare before we start. You know, uh, uh, operation uh, prep planning. Then you know uh, uh, we have when we start the operation before we start. Then we start when we start the operation. Uh, we have to also to uh, to to follow the checklist. Uh, as many points we have should be filled up from uh, vessel side, port side, uh, or the uh, bunkering vessel side. And after uh, bunkering, we have to uh, fill up also the checklist, you know, and then to, uh, for the safe disconnection uh, of uh, uh, hose here to avoid, you know, any leakage. So let's, you know, uh, that's your basic and the risks. In general, I know what we are talking about. Uh, high ignition temperature, you see that's uh, 600 degrees. Here we have 210 for, uh, for diesel. And uh, the mixture, you know, uh, of mixture of uh, gas in there is two, 5 to 15 percent. Explosion fire risk. This is a uh, point we should take under consideration uh, and the crew. Uh, should follow all regulation and restrictions. Now we are talking about the low temperature. You see the low temperature uh, here is uh, an uh, uh, atmospheric tank minus uh, 63 degrees. And uh, of course, you know, uh, in case of the direct contact, uh, we have, we have observe the results, uh, frost burns and we observe here uh, steel, normal steel uh, may uh, will become brittle. That's a very, uh, very dangerous. Okay, we have a special uh, uh, system protecting uh, protecting uh, uh, the ship's hull uh, in place uh, when the uh, cargo hose is connected to the manifold. Gas release uh, uh, is to be prevented because flammable cryogenic nature. That's what we are talking about. Human safety factor, you know, that's uh, what we are talking about the, about the crew. Uh, the training, uh, knowledge, understanding, proficiency as a result of the appropriate training and certification. Uh, this is, you know, uh, also uh, proper instruction, the instruction, you know, uh, and the knowledge of the ship uh, uh, bunker equipment and procedures. Uh, the person involved in connection of bunker hose personnel in the direct uh, vicinity of these operations. 
uh, should use a, a, a protective clothing and equipment to avoid, first of all, you know, uh, uh, this uh, cold burns in case of uh, direct contact with gas. Uh, and of course, we are talking about the additional equipment like uh, uh, communication, radio communication system, VHFs, you know, another system which should be, you know, uh, uh, which should be uh, probably, you know, intrinsic intrinsically safe. So do not uh, produce any sparks. Ability to use communication language and effective means of communication this is very important. I remember from my practice, I observed, you know, in some terminals, uh, there was a problem, you know, where uh, to uh, get, you know, a, uh, to ensure the good communication in English. So that's uh, from the shore side, I mean, you know, that, 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 that's very important, especially in case of emergency, when they were under stress, and then we have to react very, uh, very fast in a way, and uh, and there should be, you know, usually we use a special procedures, commission procedures for this. Then we are following special precautions for allergy, cryogenic substance. And finally, the teamwork culture is essential. You know, uh, though this uh, what uh, uh, what the uh, what the Gunnar has presented, you know, it's uh, different culture depends. We have, we have on board, you know, also, you know, the crew, uh, uh, many uh, nations, you know, uh, uh, on board, you know, and they have, you know, uh, to work together to form a teamwork. Uh, and of course, you know, just in case of emergency response uh, to deal with conditions of liquid spirits or fire. This is, you know, uh, 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 problem uh, uh, which the crew has uh, uh, has to take care. Uh, I think you know it's uh, important because uh, uh, because uh, uh, looks like the LNG uh, fuel, which is uh, maybe not quite uh, zero emission uh, solution. Uh, still, we observe you know the CO2. Okay, we have no uh, uh, fixed particles in in the flue gas. Uh, but you know, uh, uh, some uh, some uh, 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 ideas is also to use you know the bio uh, biogas methane, which is a, uh, uh, as a biogas, and uh, this uh, ensure the reduction of the CO two emission in, in the flue gas. You know. So that's that's I think is uh, everything is ahead of us, you know, and uh, probably we'll observe some mixture of uh, of. Uh, uh, of this uh, systems, uh, so what what we are uh, uh, working over the new uh, the development of the IGF code for the new for the new fuels. So the more or less you know uh, uh, what I would like to say here we have you know uh, uh, as an example of the offshore vessel with uh, LNG, you know, that Silla, it's uh, very engaged, you know, in the, in, in the manufacturing of this uh, tank. This is typical, typical pressure tank, you know, with, uh, with the pressure inside of about 10 bars. Uh, and the gas is, uh, and the temperature is minus uh, 31 uh, one degrees. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions like this, okay. Thank you, Zbigniew. Uh, yes, uh, I prepared uh, one question. Of, um, now, now we will start a Q and uh, A session, but uh, I would like to start with you. Yeah. Um, so when we are talking about the causes uh, uh, of most accidents at sea, uh, we see that according to the Mariners Alerting and Reporting Scheme, human error accounts for the majority. Uh, of maritime accidents. Uh, this is due to this occurs due to improper training and the lack of lack of training, inexperience, uh, fatigue, uh, and and uh, and just being overworked. But if we remove the human factor uh, from uh, this uh, equation, let's say, uh, from your point of view, uh, considering the IGF code and the new rules and regulations. Um, what is uh, put uh, first in place? Is it the 
we have to reduce emissions and we have to have uh, zero emissions, uh, zero emission vessels, or is it to, that we need uh, 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 a safety? What is more important uh, from your point of view uh, currently in this situation? Well, what, what I may say, you know, uh, from, uh, from, the, from the experience making for the gas tank, as you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, the systems, you know, uh, which are, you know, installed on board of vessels, uh, uh, now, uh, you know, they are, you know, and uh, uh, manufactured in, in, in a safe way, you know, and then they are assured a very high level of, 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 uh, uh, of the safety on board when, uh, when properly used, of course. Because, you know, we should, you know, it, it, you, you may imagine the tank, uh, the tanks are, you know, uh, uh, the projects, uh, how, how long they may be used. They are projected for the 25 years of use. So that are longer, longer than the vessel. However, you know, uh, they are made from the proper materials, everything, you know, to be, to be, uh, to, to uh, stay, you know, in the good country for a long time. Uh, so then we are talking about both, you know, because uh, that's the step to reduce, uh, uh, to reduce emissions. Uh, as you know, now the LNG gas, even within the EU is, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, some, you know, it's uh, uh, the idea is to use it for some period of time only to change for the electric supply and so on. Uh, I mean, uh, however, you know, uh, this gas, you know, it's uh, it's a solution uh, for, for the long time, probably because, you know, uh, 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 you know, the many vessels, uh, if we have vessels, you know, using uh, uh, LNG gas. Let's say still we have we observe and uh, 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 better environment uh, conditions uh, for the crew. The safety, as I said, follow first of all is training, and of course to uh, to follow all procedures. That's safety culture, which is very important. You know, for some people it's a strange, you know, because they are on board, you know, of cargo vessel. And they have the behavior like to be of, like on board of the uh, a gas tanker, for instance, which is, you know, the gas tanker. Okay, we have to take her because it's our car and so on. But here it's just only fuel. They think it's only fuel, nothing else. That is a different. It's not a diesel. It's not. A, it's not a heavy fuel. It's a bit different, you know. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, could you please now uh, stop sharing uh, your screen and uh, I would like to ask uh, Anders to join us as well with the uh, video. Okay, and, uh, I will do. Yeah, I will do. okay. Great, great. Uh, so I have, uh, I will now um, start from the beginning just to go through each presentation with some uh, questions which we received on chat uh, from our participants. Um, First of all, uh, one exciting question could be, uh, as we talked about autonomous vessels, uh, we see that uh, a lot of uh, such autonomous driving is currently happening on, on the road. And uh, from my point of view, uh, I think that uh, on the road, we have uh, more factors uh, on which we should worry about then uh, we should have a shipping. Uh, should then shipping maybe become a pioneering uh, sector to integrate such technology? Are you asking me? Yeah, yeah, sorry, Anders, for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we think that uh, shipping is one of the areas where you could uh, really uh, benefit from, uh, from testing autonomous uh, or autonomy. And as I said, autonomy is really a scale of varying from totally manual through automated systems and to this uh, uh, idea of having something that operates completely of its own and take, makes its own decisions. <clears throat> uh, I think that uh, it's quite a, quite a long way to get to, to the end point where, where you have a system that's capable of, of making um, intelligent decisions in, in all kinds of uh, situations. It's true that uh, um, the maritime environment is uh, less cluttered than what you would find for cars. 
but still, if you're moving uh, close to shore, uh, you have quite a few challenges. Uh, if you're moving in, in areas of rivers, you have debris from rivers uh, that's hard to spot. Uh, you might have um, uh, smaller vessels. Uh, you might have people uh, doing uh, windsurfing, uh, kayaking, uh, being in, in small boats, fishing. So you need to make sure that, that the, the system is capable of catching all of these things before it's uh, deemed safe. So, uh, I mean, today, uh, vessels also run over small boats, kayaks, and so on. So uh, it's known to happen. Um, and there's no reason to think that uh, autonomous vessels uh, won't uh, do the same. They will. Um, the main difference is, of course, who is to blame. Uh, if you have a captain on board, at least you have somebody to blame and somebody to go. Uh, but uh, so, so there's there's quite a few questions. But yes, we believe that uh, that uh, uh, working with autonomy is quite suited for uh, for some parts of of uh, maritime transport. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Anders. Uh, I have an additional questions from uh, chat. Uh, uh, for you, how about using the ammonia as a hydrogen carrier? Yeah, that's uh, one of the things that's being explored uh, these days. Uh, ammonia seems to have uh, some beneficial um, properties uh, since it's uh, it, it really doesn't burn. Uh, <laughs> so you, you remove all of the explosion hazard uh, and fire hazard if you use ammonia. Um, and it's, it has uh, physical properties, which is relatively close to, for instance, liquid petroleum gas. Uh, so you can use that type of system uh, to, uh, as a tank system to, to contain um, ammonia. Um, currently, I think that the most viable solution for using it as a fuel is using it in an internal combustion engine, because uh, we know that that will work. And uh, there are also plants, both from MAN from Wurzla, from Bergen Engines here in Norway, to uh, bring uh, ammonia engines uh, into the market by 2024, 2025. Uh, so that will most definitely happen, at least in, in pilot or demonstration scale. Um, however, there are some issues with uh, ammonia as well. Uh, from the emission side, uh, NOx, of course, it, it'll produce huge amounts of NOx. Uh, that's something we know how to handle. But it will also produce uh, laughing gas or N2O, which is outside the NOx envelope uh, when it comes to, to handling. And N2O has 300 times uh, the greenhouse gas effect as CO2. So where you think methane slip might be a problem for LNG engines, uh, N2O will be a problem for ammonia engines. Uh, and then, of course, it's the cor uh, corrosivity and toxicity of ammonia. It's a nasty uh, substance. It's really not uh, anything you uh, might call environmentally friendly. It's uh, at best, it's carbon neutral if uh, or carbon free if you produce it carbon free. So, uh, but uh, yeah, um, I think it's been looking looked into. If if uh, we go that way, I think it's uh, too early to say. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Anders. Uh, I have now one question for Mr. Bitsinski. Um, how crews were trained to deal with uh, innovative technologies? We already heard from uh, your presentation about the IGF code, and uh, uh, I want to hear what is the experience from Poland with uh, some kind of drills, and uh, how how uh, you familiarize with new tech? What is the weakest point? Uh, and I would also add here one question, which is uh, which could be quite interesting. Um, uh, from Mr. Koval Kowalewski, he said that three obligatory bunkerings should include uh, two times fire and one time explosion to earn experience, which should eventually be useful to, to deal with uh, real hazards. Uh, are we ready for such a step? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh... So uh, regarding regarding to regarding to training first, you know, uh, so you know the, the training. Uh, what, what I must say, you know, uh, uh, we when we started this training uh, was uh, not IGF code was uh, still you know discussed in IMO, 
because you know uh, I participate in the in the IMO uh, HTW sessions, you know, every year in regular basis. I've been engaged also, you know, in preparatory works with this, you know, years ago. And uh, okay, and then you know. Uh, I prepared, uh, I can developed, you know, the, the, the program, which was in general based, you know, on, on uh, some, uh, uh, some uh, uh, proposed, you know, uh, uh, programs uh, for, for this type of training. Uh, before, uh, later it was included in a CCW. Uh, the first training uh, uh, I remember was uh, for uh, some uh, companies from, uh, from, uh, from Norway. Uh, for the for the world crew, you know, and the first it was a really a theoretical training. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, a review of the IGF code and the step by step, you know, uh, we you know uh, uh, explain you know all the problems with uh, ship construction, safety, you know, uh, 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 bunker calculation, and so on. Uh, still, without uh, without the simulators, you know. No simulator, no, 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 not a simulator available on the market. Uh, the S, even in, in STCW, you know, then you have the simulator, which is uh, a briefly as a approved simulator without any details. Till now, we have no one. Okay, and okay, we have an, uh, an, a simulator, which is a part uh, of the ENSO simulator. We may simulate, you know, uh, bunkering operations uh, from shore. Uh, from truck and from uh, uh, bunkering vessel, uh, and uh, but the STCW, you know, allow you know to to uh, uh, to replace you know two bunkerings by by that was you know for uh, our experience, and uh, we had a, a good uh, feedback. So was only the uh, uh, not uh, a large number of vessels, uh, but with the feedbacks, you know, were uh, very uh, very positive. Uh, the training, uh, it basic training and advanced training, uh, uh, it was you know uh, three to five days. Uh, to, uh, you know that that uh, it's a quite long training, and usually the companies uh, uh, they you know uh, uh, that have decided to send all crew, all crew members, you know, for this type of training. I mean, from the basic one and uh, and officers and uh, master. Uh, chief engineer of advanced training. That was, you know, our experience. Uh, now, uh, uh, you know, uh, usually we have uh, uh, training available, you know, uh, almost every week. It depends on the of the requirements. And then we have followed now. We have followed now uh, 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 requirements of the annual model courses and the certificates. Before, uh, from the beginning, the certificates were issued by uh, by the Maritime School. But you know, uh, since uh, three years, you know, uh, now they are issued, you know, uh, uh, by uh, Polish Maritime Administration official certificate. That's you know about the training, what we do. Uh, and the second question, because if, uh, you can, you may remember the second one. Uh, 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 yeah, the second was uh, was uh, that uh, three obligatory bunkering uh, should include two times fire and one time explosion to earn experience useful for, to deal with uh, real hazards uh, and are we ready for such a step you know uh, at the moment you know uh, what what the what the sccw said you know uh, according to sccw we are talking about the three bunkerings you know i mean normal operations routine operations with the bunkering so however you know uh, we may uh, we may uh, on the simulator now we may simulate, you know, the uh, leakage and and you know uh, and the problems with the fire hose integrity. You know. uh, with sorry, we had with the cargo hose integrity. Then we may uh, we may uh, simulate this, and we may simulate the emergency situation as the use of ESD emergency shutdown system, which you know normally uh, when you are doing a real operations, uh, if uh, well, nothing happens, you never use this ESD system. But on the simulator, we may use the ESD system, you know, uh, to show, you know, the trees, how it works. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bicinski. Thank you, Mr. Valand. Uh, we had, uh, I think, a really interesting webinar today. Uh, we are, uh, thank you for all participants that join us today. 
uh, and I would like to just uh, have uh, one word to introduce an additional webinar next Thursday. Uh, you could also join us uh, on that webinar and we will discuss the new topic uh, uh, on, on, on next Thursday. Also, you have additional information on our website and uh, you can see this webinar as all other webinars on our YouTube channel. And uh, thank you, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a nice week, a nice coming week, a nice day today. Yes, have a nice week, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Bye bye. bye.